Thank you, Mark, and good morning. We are continuing our studies in 1 Timothy, and we're going to begin chapter 2 this morning and look at verses 1 through 7. Paul writes, first of all then, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men for kings and all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godly, godliness and dignity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator also between God and men, the man Christ Jesus who gave himself as a ransom for all the testimony given at the proper time. For this, I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am telling the truth. I am not lying as a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow in prayer. That's a great hymn by Charles Wesley. Ransom sinners, that's what we are. That's what Paul speaks of in our text this morning of 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 7. The conversion of Charles Spurgeon is a story I think most of you are familiar with. It's a story of providence and grace, how a boy of 15 found shelter from a snowstorm in a primitive Methodist chapel and heard a simple sermon on Isaiah 45, verse 22, Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. The preacher fixed his eyes on Charles and said, Young man, look to Jesus Christ. Look, look, look. You have nothing to do but look and live. He did, and he became the Prince of Preachers. 2,400 years earlier, God told Israel that his salvation would reach to the ends of the earth. Who in that day imagined his plan included a boy on a far-off island thousands of years later? That's the inscrutable plan and scope of God's love. It was the scope of Paul's love as well. And it is his chief interest here in 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 7, which he based on that great evangelistic verse, Isaiah 45, verse 22. So he began the chapter by instructing the church to be praying for all men. So we would live in peace and men would be saved. In other words, so the gospel would go to the ends of the earth. This begins Paul's instruction on the church. He later says that that is the reason he wrote this letter to Timothy. It was so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God. That conduct involves prayer. In fact, he begins, first of all, meaning of first importance, not first in the order of instruction, but this is of first importance that you pray for all men. A vital church, a living and healthy church is a praying church. We pray for one another, we pray for our needs, we pray for the ministry that is essential for health and progress, but We are to have a worldwide vision. That is of first importance, Paul says. So why is prayer so hard? Is it just me? I don't think so. I think it's hard for so many of us. And why is that if it is so important? Why is it so easy to let everything else crowd it out? Well, because it is so important. William Cooper wrote in one of his hymns, Satan trembles when he sees the weakest saint upon his knees. 
If that's so, then Satan quakes when he sees a whole church on its knees. That's the reason it's hard to pray. One of the devil's schemes is to keep us occupied with other things. Now, I don't want to limit it all to Satan, our adversary. There's the world, there's the flesh. All of these things affect us. We desire things that we shouldn't desire, but he can get us off on things as well. He can direct us not to bad things, but to good things or neutral things, indifferent things, but anything to keep us off our knees. Paul says, first of all, then pray. He actually uses four different words for prayer, though they seem largely similar to each other. It's hard to distinguish their meaning. Calvin admitted he didn't completely understand the difference between them, though they are probably the differences of thanksgiving, praise, and requests or intercession. What is clear from this piling up of words for prayer is that Paul was emphasizing the urgency of it. Pray for people, pray for all people, pray on behalf of all men. In other words, have a big soul and a wide vision. Pray for all men. Now, taken at face value, that's a lot of people. In fact, if Paul means pray for every individual in the world, then he's given us an impossible task, and certainly that's not his meaning. This is an example of the word all having a restricted meaning, and there are many examples of that. For example, Mark chapter 11, verse 32, Mark wrote, or our Lord said, all or everyone considered, this is Mark speaking, all or everyone, the same word, all or everyone, considered John, John the Baptist, to have been a real prophet. Well, now ask yourself, did everyone consider that? Did the Sadducees consider John the Baptist a real prophet? Did Caesar consider him to be a real prophet? No, obviously what he's speaking of here is many Jews of Galilee and Judea did. In John chapter 3, verse 26, John's disciples told him that all were going to Jesus for baptism. Every individual in the whole world? No, not even every individual in Israel, but a lot of people were, multitudes were. There are many examples of all being used in this restricted sense, but expressing a large number of people or a wide variety of people, all kinds of people. Words always must be read in their context. Both Jews and Greeks are all under sin, Paul wrote in Romans 3, verse 6. That is a universal statement. That is everyone without exception, but one exception, Christ himself. So even there, we take him as the exception to that. Here Paul is referring to all without distinction. Not all without exception, all without distinction. Pray for all kinds of people, all classes of men, he was saying. But not not just for ourselves, but for others outside of our circle, outside of our church, outside of our believing community. Pray for unbelievers as well as believers. And I think that's clear from the next verse, verse 2, where Paul indicates who the all is he's referring to. For kings and all who are in authority. Paul was correcting a natural tendency we have to limit our prayers to those we know and those we care about. Christians have a duty to all kinds of people. The class that Paul specifies here is rulers, governors. We may have a tendency to withhold prayer from a politician that we don't like, but uh, remember the historical context here. Paul wrote when Nero was emperor, Maybe he entertained the hope that even that monster could be converted. The gospel did penetrate the palace during his first imprisonment in Rome. He sent the Philippians greetings from those of Caesar's household. And Paul himself has just told us that that the gospel, 
saved him, the chief of sinners, the foremost of sinners. Well, if it could save him, could it not save Nero? Perhaps he had that on his mind. Prayer is effective. It, it is the means that the sovereign God has given us to obtain his will and carry out his eternal decree. That's why Satan trembles when he sees the weakest saint upon his knees. But Paul stated his stated reason for instructing us to pray for emperors and kings and judges and governors and presidents and all those in authority over us is not specifically, at least, for their conversion, but so that there will be peace so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. A tranquil and quiet life is one of, the, is one of calm in the civil order. It's one of uh, political and social peace. War and rebellion ravages the church as well as a nation. Uh, in the 17th century, the Thirty Years' War was fought up and down Germany. It was a war of religion, one of the numerous wars of religion in which the Protestants and the Catholics engaged in combat. When it ended in 1648, more than half of the country's population was dead through war, through famine, through all of the calamity of those 30 years. Whole cities, villages, and farms had disappeared. It took Germany 200 years to recover. Spiritually, it never did. The land of the Reformation became indifferent to the gospel. The wars of religion soured people on the whole idea of religion. So Paul says, pray for your leaders. Pray for, that they have wisdom. Pray that, that we have peace as a result of, of their wise rule. Not so that, that we may prosper and enjoy, enjoy life. There's nothing wrong with enjoying life, and there's nothing wrong with prospering. That's a good thing, but that's not Paul's reason for saying pray. It's so that we can live in all godliness and dignity. Uh, the word dignity means gravity and suggests moral earnestness, taking life seriously, uh, living a serious life. We, as God's people, should be serious people. This was Paul's instruction to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 4.11. I love this verse because it, it, on the one hand, it seems so uh, mundane, so unspectacular, and yet it really gives us a clear definition of the Christian life, of how we are to live our lives, how we're to be responsible in the daily things of life. He says to the Thessalonians, make it your ambition. You want to be ambitious for something? Here's what you need to be ambitious for, to lead a quiet life and attend to your own business and work with your hands and not be in need. Don't be dependent on people. Be a responsible person. That is a good witness to the world. But that life that he describes there develops best in times of peace when we can worship the Lord openly and freely, when we can study freely and quietly and we can teach our children the faith without harassment. Of course, peace can become an occasion for self-gratification among Christians and result in a worldly church. That's when providence disturbs our peace. That's what Peter is speaking of in 1 Peter 4, verse 7, when he says, the judgment of God begins in the household of God. Still, peace is desired. It is necessary for developing a life of godliness and dignity, which is our witness to the world. So when the gospel spread, spreads in times of peace and when the church then expands as a result, the initial growth of the church occurred in times of peace. We see it in the first century and into the second century. That is known to historians as the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome. It was 180 years of peace generally throughout the world. The pirates were cleared off of the Mediterranean Sea. There was order 
in the Roman Empire, roads stretched all across the empire, giving Paul and the others freedom to travel and to preach the gospel in the synagogues and in the marketplaces. Well, we have the same in the 19th century, which is the age of the great missionary movement during the Pax Britannica, when England ruled the seas. You see statues of Victoria sometimes holding a small globe in her hand. England ruled the globe, and so missionaries went out to all of the continents in that age. So Paul's instruction is that we pray for kings, rulers, so that there will be peace, so that we will grow spiritually in our relationship with the Lord, so that the gospel will advance across the globe. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, Paul says in verse 3. It is good and acceptable because God is a God of peace. Satan is the dog of war, a murderer from the beginning, Jesus said. Peace is the Lord's nature. But it's also good because, again, peace facilitates growth of the church. And that seems to be Paul's main point here and the reason we are to be a people of prayer. He says it is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. And then he adds in verse 4, who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. That is God. He is the only God. He is the triune God. And He is the Savior. He wants and wills men to be saved. All men, male and female. That's Isaiah 45, verse 22. Look unto me, and be ye saved all the ends of the earth. God's plan of salvation was never limited to one people, one race or nation, but always was worldwide in its compass. That's always been His plan. Israel was to be a light to the nations. When God called Abraham, He told him early in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 3 that in him all the families of the earth will be blessed. This is the reason for Paul's instruction that the church be a people of intercession with a broad vision. God desires all men to be saved. So, Pray that his plan be accomplished. And there is a logic to the Lord's love and our prayers. Paul gives two reasons for them in verse 5. First, he says, for there is one God. That's why his love is worldwide. There's not a God for Israel and a God for Italy. There's not a God for this part of the world and for that part of the world. There's one God. And his love for that world is worldwide. He is the one God, the only God, therefore the God of everyone. Now people don't believe that. People reject him. People make gods of their own imagination. But he's still the God and creator of all things. And he has not rejected his creation. His creation has rejected him, he has not rejected it, and he will save it. That is his will. But how will he save it? Well, maybe he has lots of ways of doing that. After all, the fact that there is one God doesn't rule out the possibility that there might be more than one plan for rescuing, rescuing humanity. John Stott put that idea in a question that he didn't believe, but that many people do believe. Uh, why should not God, the one God who wants all people to be saved, save them in different ways? Some through Hinduism or Buddhism, others through Judaism or Islam, and yet others through New Age, and he goes on to list other possibilities. Well, that's a common thought today, as it always has been. It was a common thought in Paul's day. Romans didn't care if you worship Jehovah or you worship Christ, or you wish worshipped uh, Zeus or Jupiter or any other number of gods as long as you paid homage to Caesar. Everything was okay if 
you paid homage to the emperor. Well, today, we have this idea that if, if people even consider the idea of salvation, there are many roads to that, many ways to doing that. It's a very common idea today, but to that all-inclusive-ism, the apostle answers with a strict exclusivism. The one God has only one way of salvation, and that is through one man. He is Christ Jesus, who Paul calls a mediator. A mediator, a mediator is a go-between, a person who stands in the midst, in the middle of things, and brings about reconciliation. He solves problems and ends disputes. This is what Job saw that he needed but couldn't find. He was troubled. Why was he suffering all of this as an innocent man? He needs to talk, talk to God and he needs to have this thing reconciled. And so he seeks that, that mediator, uh, imagining himself going to court with God to resolve his problem. But he said, there is no umpire between us who may lay his hand upon both of us. Well, there was no one in the world to do that, no, no one among mankind who could do that, bring the two together, because all men, all women, all people of the world are in the same situation, guilty. We all need an umpire to bridge the gap between us and God. But Job's cry of despair has been answered in Christ. He can stand in between us, lay his hand on both of us, be our umpire, bring us together because of who he is and what he has done that makes him unique. He is both God and man. And because of that, he can represent both sides and mediate between us. He's God's eternal son. As Paul indicated in chapter 1, and he became a human being through his mother Mary by the miraculous conception of the Holy Spirit. So he is the God-man. And because he is, he could do the work that no one else in the universe could do when he died on the cross. Paul describes his sacrifice in the dramatic word ransom. He gave himself as a ransom for all. The two words Paul uses here, man and ransom, explain the Lord's role as our mediator. And look at two great events, his birth and his death. He is the man Christ Jesus because he was born of a virgin and he is a ransom because of what happened on the cross. As John Stott wrote, he was born to die. It's a very simple way of putting it, but that is the mission of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was born in order to die. He was a great teacher. No one ever taught like he taught. He was a miracle worker. He healed sickness and disease. He raised the dead. He went about doing good, only good. That's not mentioned because that's not what saves. His death alone saves. It was a sacrifice that Paul calls a ransom that was willingly given. Now, I called this word ransom dramatic because it is. We, we're familiar with, with it because um, hijackers and rogue governments take uh, people hostage and imprison them until... Their uh, government pays a large sum of money, and when the money is paid, people are released. Well, that's a ransom. It is a payment made to set a captive free. And the ancient world was very familiar with that. It's a very common word uh, among the ancients. You see it all the way back in uh, Homer's Iliad. When a warrior was captured in battle, he was made a prisoner or a slave of his enemy until a ransom was paid. And then when that ransom was paid, the prisoner was free. He was released. And that's what Christ did on the cross. 
It's what he said he would do in Mark chapter 10, verse 45, give his life a ransom for many. The word for ransom that Paul uses here is the same word that's used in Mark 10, only a little different. This word that's used in Mark 10 has a preposition added to it. The Greeks would do that. They would add prepositions to verbs that intensified the word or gave it a specific nuance. And that's what's done here in this word for ransom. So that it has the meaning of something like substitution ransom. That's what Christ became for us on the cross. He took our place. We've broken God's law, every one of us, through Adam as our representative, and then on our own, through our own deeds, our thoughts, our actions, and we deserve God's wrath. It's just. But he took our place. He suffered the penalty in our place. That death of the perfect man was the ransom paid for us, paid in our place. We had fallen, as it were, into the hands of justice whose sword is raised over every person because of our guilt. But when Christ became our ransom, justice was satisfied, put away her sword, and released us. So Paul is saying, because God is God, the only God, the creator of this world, he's not forsaken it. He wants it saved, and he did what was necessary to accomplish that, sacrifice his own son. That's the love of God. It is wide. He desires all men to be saved, and because that is God's desire, it should be ours too. It was Paul's, and he instructed churches to pray for all men. But this raises some questions. Is Paul teaching universalism, that all mankind is saved? And how does God's desire for all men to be saved fit with the doctrine of unconditional election? That God chooses some and not all. These are natural questions that follow from this passage because Scripture is consistent. From Genesis to Revelation, Scripture is consistent. It doesn't contradict itself. The Bible clearly does teach unconditional election. Paul taught that. Uh, for example, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 13. We should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. In other words, before time ever began, He chose us. He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ. Chose us, predestined us. It's clearly teaching the doctrine of unconditional election. And there are other verses, many other verses. John chapter 6, verses 37 through 44. Acts 13, verse 48. 1 Peter 1 Verses 1 through 2, all of the writers of the New Testament speak of it. Not all are chosen and called out of darkness into light. So how do we harmonize that with God's desire for all to be saved? One suggestion is to make a distinction between what God wants and what He wills. He wants everybody saved, but he wills something different. And there are Calvinists who even suggest that, but that's no solution. It, it introduces actually inconsistency into the mind of God that cannot be there. And it's not really faithful to the meaning of the word here, desire, in, uh, in verse 4. It means will. It's used, for example, in Ephesians 1.11, where Paul says that God works all things after the counsel of His will. What He desires, He does. So if, if God's desire is His decree, if what He desires, He wills, then who did Christ die to save? It's a proper question because 
when a ransom was paid to free a captive, the captive was freed. The payment was effective. It's always effective. It's the same with us. When we go to the Whole Foods store and we buy a head of lettuce and we give the cashier a couple of dollars for it or we get our credit card cleared, at that moment, what happens? We don't sit and look at the cashier and say, well, now what? It's put in the bag. It's ours. The, 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 the payment is effective, and God's payment was effective. That being so, we're really left with only one of two answers to the question. If Christ died to save everyone, then everyone must be saved because he paid for the sins of those he died for. That's universalism. Everyone in the end is saved. And that's a very popular idea today. But we know that cannot be because the Bible is clear, not all are saved. Hell is real. And at the end of time, following the final judgment, death and Hades will be thrown into the lake of fire. So this word all must have a restricted meaning, which brings us back to our earlier examination of verse 4. I urge that entreaties and prayers be made on behalf of all men. It cannot be everyone, all without exception. Paul would then be making an impossible demand upon us. It can only mean all without distinction, all kinds of people. That's the context supports that. So what Paul is saying is God desires to save all his people, all his elect, those he gave to his son to redeem, to ransom by his blood, and we are to pray that his will be done. That's the doctrine of limited atonement or the doctrine of particular redemption. The alternative to that is unlimited atonement, that God does want everyone saved and Christ provided salvation for all, but people perish because of unbelief. They don't accept the provision. Of course, again, that's inconsistent with election, that Christ would die for those that the Father did not choose. But also, nowhere does the Bible explain the sacrifice of Christ as a mere provision. He did not die to make salvation possible or to make men savable. His death actually saves. The, the, the payment actually purchases those for whom it was paid. At the cross, he bought his people. He bought them out of sin and death. And in time, the Spirit of God applies that to them. He paid the full price for their sins, especially the sin of unbelief. That's not a sin that he left unpaid, as some have suggested. The sin of unbelief is the root of all sin. That's Romans 14, verse 23. Whatever is not of faith is sin. Now, any other view violates both Scripture and the character of God because it would mean that sins were paid for twice, first by Christ on the cross and then by the sinner, unrepentant sinner for eternity. And that would be a gross injustice. Augustus Top Lady put it well. Payment, God's justice cannot twice demand. First, at the bleeding surety's hand, and then again at mine. No, it cannot. Justice cannot. The price of salvation has been paid in full for all for whom Christ died. Therefore, they will believe. And I, if I be lifted up from the cross, will draw all men to myself. Christ is not saying, if I'm lifted up from the cross, I'll make it possible. I'll make a provision. He says, if I'm lifted up, and he was, I will draw all men to myself. Now ask yourself, did he draw all men to himself? Has everybody been saved? Well, the answer to that is, yes, he has drawn all men to himself. All without distinction, not all without exception. I like what Spurgeon said here about the cross. He said, he called it the marvelous magnet that attracts everyone, to, that attracts everyone of the true metal. 
Who is every one of the true metal? It's the elect. It's those God has chosen. Salvation of the lost is God's work from beginning to end, from eternity to eternity. He is, as Paul said in verse 3, God our Savior. It really says it all. He saves not we ourselves. It is His sovereign work. That is inescapably clear from Scripture. I think it's indicated at the very beginning of the Bible, the first verse of the Bible. We have there a statement of His absolute sovereignty, if you just consider it for a moment. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. When there was nothing, God made everything. He takes the initiative in everything. And that's Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. And you were dead in your trans trespasses and sins, but God, even when we were dead, made us alive together with Christ and raised us up with Him. It's all God's work. So He is God our Savior. But what does this mean for the main subject of this text, which is prayer. Pray for all men. Why pray if God is sovereign, absolutely sovereign? If God has a plan and it cannot be frustrated, it's going to be accomplished, why pray? Why evangelize? It's going to happen. Well, let me turn that around. Why pray if God is not sovereign? After all, if it's up to me to evangelize and get things done and get people saved, why ask God to save souls? It's, it's for me to do. The reality is the only reason we should pray and do pray is because God is sovereign, because He is all-powerful, because He can answer the prayers that we make on His behalf and for His people. And there is a logic to it. The God who ordained the end has also ordained the means to obtaining the end. And prayer is that. That's why He instructs us to pray, because He has given us the means to obtain the very things He has commanded and He has planned. And so Jesus told His disciples in Matthew 9, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into His harvest. If we don't ask, we won't receive. If we don't pray, God won't bless, and we will wither. So ask, beseech. That's what Paul is saying here. First of all, I urge that entreaties be made on behalf of all men. George Mueller was a five-point Calvinist. He believed in the absolute sovereignty of God, and so he knew that God was good for all of his promises and asked in faith and asked for much. He knew that if we ask in faith, we will receive. And so that's what he did. He prayed daily for his bread. He prayed daily for the bread of the orphans that he cared for. And he saw God's mighty hand throughout his long, frugal, faithful life. God always provided. May God give us the faith that leads us to pray for our needs and making entreaties for all men, for rulers and peace, for workers and conversions, for the growth of the church to God's glory. Now, th this great work of God, this work of salvation was what Paul was sent out to proclaim to the Gentiles, to the nations. That's what he says in verse 7. And he affirms that by saying, I am not lying. The false teachers were undercutting his authority and denying that he was an apostle. And in doing that, they were denying the, the message that he preached. Well, they were the liars. What Paul says here is true. He was a true apostle and his message was true. It's God's revelation. It reveals God's love for the world. The gospel is the good news of salvation. It is the message of God's free grace, His sovereign grace. 
his unsearchable love for the Gentiles as well as the Jews. It reaches out to all the ends of the earth. And it is infinitely personal. When Christ came into this world, he knew why he came and he knew for whom he came. I believe that. In his, in his divine nature, he knew each individual that he came for. It's a very personal thing. He knows his sheep. He's known them from all eternity. Definite atonement, particular redemption affirms that. It affirms the personal nature of Christ's sacrifice for us. He came for us individually. He came for us personally when we were lost. He will never forsake us now that we are found. That is reassuring. So we should love Him. We should love one another. We should pray for one another and pray for the world as Paul tells us. We may not be able to go ourselves to the ends of the earth, but we can pray that the gospel would and that it would be preached clearly and that through it God would draw His elect who are there. If you're here today without Christ, if you're not believing in Him. Our prayer is that the Lord would open your heart to know what you are, that you are lost and in need of a Savior. And if you think, well, but this thing about election and particular redemption seems to exclude me, it seems to be very exclusive. No, election is not about excluding people. It's about including people. There is none who seeks after God. No, not one. Without election, left to ourselves, none would seek and none would be found. Election is not about excluding. God doesn't sit on His throne and say, no, no, you, you can't come. Uh, I, you may have believed, but you're not part of it. You're excluded. And no, you're excluded also. That's not. Election opens up heaven. It includes. And what is the sign of election? It's faith. It's believing. It's trusting in Christ. This is what Paul says. He speaks of being the, the teacher of the nations in faith and truth. So we believe. That's what the elect do. If you wonder, am I one of the elect? Believe. It's that simple. Trust in Him. And you're one of the elect. That's the evidence. Or, as that Methodist minister said to young Spurgeon, look to Jesus Christ Look, 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 you have nothing to do but look and live. And that is the invitation to you. Look and live. May God help you to do that. And help all of us to rejoice in the great God we serve and be very much engaged in His service, fundamentally of which is praying. May God make us men and women of prayer. Let's end with a hymn from the Songs of Praise book, one I think we all enjoy, hymn number 23, Before the Throne of God Above, and then remain standing for the benediction. Hymn number 23. Father, it's a great thing to be able to say, my soul is purchased by His blood. Because to say that is to say, salvation is of the Lord. You accomplished it from beginning to end. It's all of grace. We give you praise and thanks. May that motivate us to live lives that bring honor and glory to our triune God. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.